you very much, Jan, for this kind introduction. Um, I would like to thank you very much to, to you and to Cristiano for having invited me here to, to give this, this um, talk today. And thank you very much for those of you who will be listening uh, to, my, to my talk. I really hope it will be uh, interesting and useful for you. And in any case, if you have any questions at the end of the presentation, I will be more than happy to answer these questions. So I'm going to share my screen with you. So let me know if you can see the screen. Yes. Perfect. So very briefly uh, to introduce myself for you to understand the context in which I am doing this uh, uh, research. Uh, I have different, different hats. So I am a researcher in interpreting studies and uh, an interpreter trainer as well, because I am the director of the interpreting department and I teach at the master's program in conference interpreter inter interpreting here. Uh, I am also a conference interpreter mainly for the uh, international organizations based in Geneva, and I am a course designer. So I think it's important for you to understand that uh, I, I, I wear all these, all these hats, um, complementary hats, I would say. And these are the research projects that I have been, uh, I have uh, been carrying out in the context of this broad topic of interpreting in conflict zones. So uh, as you will see, um, when we talk about a conflict zone and interpreting in this context, there are different uh, types of actors involved. And so I have been doing research about interpreting uh, in the context of the military, the armed forces, interpreting in human rights missions, and also everything that is related to humanitarian uh, organizations, that is humanitarian interpreting. And my studies, uh, well, uh, cover different uh, contexts and different geographical regions, as you can see here. The last uh, project I am working in is uh, um, a project on war reporting in, in Ukraine, but in the past I carried out these projects as well. Um, my studies are mainly qualitative, uh, and these are the methods, I'm not going to read all of them, but just for you to have an idea of the different methods that I have used in my, in my projects. And I would like to highlight the interdisciplinary nature of my projects, of my studies, because of course, I mean, they, are, they can be framed in, the, in, the, um, in translation studies, but um, when you do research about war and conflict, you necessarily have to read uh, um, uh, sources and articles, publications um, in, from other fields. No? And mainly uh, these fields are peace and conflict studies, sociology and anthropology, because some of my studies have an ethnographic component. So as an introduction, I would like to say that um, we all know that, well, unfortunately, uh, armed conflicts are inherent uh, in, in human history. Um, and then well, we, we know that uh, conflicts arise in response to a threat. It can be a result of clashes between peoples and nations or within a community. And it is only logical that when one of the parties does not speak the language of the other party, some, some type of of language mediation is necessary. And so interpreters have been invisible throughout history in this uh, um, context of armed conflicts, but they have been indispensable at the same time. And it is worth noting that all international organizations uh, that uh, are deployed in a conflict zone recruit interpreters to work in the field. So I would like to start by perhaps uh, clarifying uh, this broad term or what I consider to be a vague concept of interpreting in conflict zones. Uh, because I think we, we all agree that interpreting is interpreting, yes, but it is a situated practice. So I think interpreting in a conflict zone is vague because uh, it when you describe the role of the interpreter or the practice of interpreting, you have to take into account um, the specific context in which the interpreters work. And this context is made up of different elements, the mandate of the institution recruiting the interpreters, the type of conflict or the conflict stage, 
Is it escalation, the escalation, resol conflict resolution, etc.? The type of the operation of the mission, uh, a counterinsurgency operation, for example, in the context of the military, a humanitarian operation, a humanitarian operation carried out by the military, etc. And also the interpreter's profile. Is it a locally recruited interpreter? Is it a national interpreter, a conference interpreter deployed to work in the field, etc.? So I think uh, it is important to, um, to consider that even if we were talking about interpreting in a conflict zone, uh, the, the role of the interpreter and the practice of interpreting will change depending on the specific context in which the interpreter works. And related, regarding this context, I would like to start with this question, what, what has been studied so far in this field? Well, I have to say that in the last decade, there has been a considerable attention in the literature. The early works, uh, I mean, not, uh, not only in this century, but in the previous one, dealt with the role of the interpreter in conflicts throughout history. But I would I would say that uh, recent works focus on the interpreter's role in specific contemporary contexts. And I think there are two um, different themes. So the, on the one hand, all these publications, all these studies about the role of interpreters who work in a military context. And on the other hand, those studies uh, that deal with uh, interpreting in the humanitarian context. I, I would say that the, I mean, most of the studies uh, can be framed in one of these uh, more broad, uh, uh, broader uh, settings. Regarding the specific aspects that have been studied, I, I would highlight uh, these ones, the ones that I have included in this slide. So there have been many studies on the role of the interpreter and all the, these notions of identity and neutrality, the interpreter's positionality, and also everything that is related to interpreter training. And there have been uh, different studies that focus on the interpreter's positionality, which is an essential notion uh, in this field. And I, I will uh, go back to that afterwards. And these studies deal with interpreter's positionality in specific contexts. And that is related to what I was saying before, that it is important to take into account the specific context in which interpreters work. And here I have included some references if you are interested in learning more about this context, humanitarian context, human rights missions, uh, NGOs, or war reporting. However, I think there have been very few studies on the impact of emotions on the interpreter's uh, decision-making and behavior. And for me, that's an essential topic when we analyze the role of interpreters in a conflict. There have been more studies dealing with or examining the psychological implications uh, of uh, interpreting in, in such a challenging context, but very few studies on how our emotions, because I mean, we all have emotions, have an impact when we have to interpret in this challenging context. And that is one of the, of the topics that I will be mentioning afterwards, because I, I have tried to cover that in my studies. In conclusion, uh, I mean, when you read all this literature out there, you uh, realize that most of the studies have been carried out by scholars and not by actual practitioners or people directly involved in, the, in interpreting in these contexts. There are some exceptions that I have included here. For example, Snellman is uh, an officer, uh, same uh, for Mendez Sanchez and other, uh, other um, scholars as well, but most of the studies, I would say they have been carried out by researchers and not by actual practitioners. And again, I would like to highlight this relevance of the interpreter's positionality in this uh, topic. So moving on to, to my uh, research, I am going to focus to base my presentation today on three studies that I have uh, carried out so far. Because the idea is for you to uh, is for me to uh, um, provide a, uh, an overview of the different types of interpreters 
uh, who work uh, in, in, in a conflict zone. So these are the three studies I'm going to, uh, to talk about. The first one is a study I carried out uh, some years ago uh, on interpreting uh, and interpreters working for the military. More specifically, uh, I focused on uh, the interpreters working for the uh, Afghan, uh, for the ASP4, which is the, the, the Spanish armed forces deployed in Afghanistan. The second study is my big project dealing with uh, interpreters working for humanitarian organizations. And the third study is uh, the study I carried out in the context of human rights missions, more specifically the missions uh, deployed by the United Nations Office at Geneva. So um, regarding the, the first study, interpreting for the military, I carried out uh, this study in the context of uh, all these uh, training and mentoring, mentoring missions of local armed forces organized uh, by NATO. And here I carried out my study with uh, military personnel, with, a, uh, with a, the Spanish military personnel deployed to Afghanistan, and also with uh, Afghan interpreters, but also national interpreters working uh, with them. So as you can see here in this context, the interpreter works between the local armed forces, in this case, the Afghan, local, uh, the Afghan armed forces and the NATO contingent. And they have to speak the contingent's language, in this case, Spanish, and the language of the local armed forces, which in this case was uh, Dari and past, past, Pasto. <clears throat> But I also carried out uh, a study with uh, um, those interpreters who uh, have to work for an international team. And here the situation is a little bit different in terms of the language combination, because these interpreters have to speak English. This is the language when it, it, it is an integrated team uh, in the context of NATO, and again, the language of the local armed forces. So that was the, the context of this first study. Regarding the second study, I worked here, uh, it was a community, I mean, uh, it was community research, and I worked for the Center of Competence for Humanitarian Negotiation, which is a joint initiative of five humanitarian agencies that you can see here. So the International Committee of the Red Cross, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, the UN World Food Programme, and the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. So I worked with all these organizations in this uh, second study. And here the context is a different one. Here uh, the interpreter works between, for example, in the International Committee of the Red Cross, the interpreter works between a beneficiary and a delegate, an ICRC delegate. And in the context of the UNHCR, for example, the interpreter works between a refugee, a call the individuals of concern by the UNHCR, and an officer, usually to determine their refugee status. From a broader point of view, uh, in the, when the interpreter is recruited by a humanitarian organization in the conflict zone, she or he will have to interpret between a migrant or a refugee and a humanitarian agent. And if the interpreter is recruited to work in an even more specific setting, which is a humanitarian negotiation, uh, she or he will have to interpret between a humanitarian negotiator and uh, the local authorities, the local armed forces, etc. And I think this context is extremely complex and um, because it is humanitarian negotiation means uh, that the interpreter has to facilitate the communication when the negotiator, I mean the international, the humanitarian organization wants to access the, um, the, the local populations hmm, to provide uh, them with aid, etc. And they have to, of course, negotiate with the local authorities, etc. And then the context of the third study is uh, a different one because UN field missions um, 
I mean, um, cannot be defined as missions in a conflict zone or in a conflict related zone, because they also include mandates where there is no link whatsoever to a conflict. For example, there are missions of the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women deployed in European countries and European countries are not considered as a conflict zone. So um, interpreters here are usually deployed to go to the field. So this is interpreting in the field uh, to accompany special procedures who conduct country visits, mainly to investigate violations of human rights and asserting the compliance of member states with their human rights obligations. So it could be, uh, um, so the mission could be deployed in a conflict zone, but not during the conflict per se. And in this case, the interpreter is usually, and that's a, a, another important element, the interpreter is a UN conference interpreter who is deployed to the field to facilitate the communication between national authorities, international entities, NGOs, local populations, victims, and witnesses, and uh, special rapporteurs, independent experts, working groups, etc. So, as I said, I am going to uh, to um, focus on my the results, the findings of all these studies. Even if I have carried out all the studies, I thought that these are the, the these are quite complementary studies to provide you an overview of these topics, who the interpreters are. In, uh, in, in a conflict zone or in a conflict related uh, uh, situation? What is their positionality? Uh, what are the differences and the commonalities between these three categories of interpreters? So interpreters working for the military, humanitarian interpreters and interpreters working in the context of uh, human rights missions, intercultural communication that is essential in a conflict zone, everything that is related to emotions and ideology, the psychological and the ethical implications of working in such a challenging context. So first of all, who are the interpreters in these settings? So in the military field, there are very few military linguists. That is very few military personnel who work as interpreters. So what happens is that the armed forces have to recruit local civilians to work with them or local civilians or members of our diaspora. For example, in the case of the Spanish, um, Spanish armed forces, they recruited in Spain, Iranian um, interpreters who had left the country Iran uh, after Khomeini's revolution. So they lived in Spain, they recruited them in Spain to travel with them to Afghanistan because they spoke Farsi, which is similar to Dari, the language is spoken in Afghanistan. Then in the humanitarian field, you have different profiles. In the, in the case of the uh, UNHCR, the interpreters often belong to the community in conflict. They, sometimes they are even, they have the same status, they are refugees and they are called incentive workers. In the context of the ICRC, they, they are mobile interpreters because the ICRC wants to avoid uh, having interpreters who belong to the community, but sometimes they have to recruit locals as well. And for, in, the, in other organizations, interpreters are locally recruited, most of them, I would say. And then in the context of human rights missions, as I said before, they are a completely different profile. They are trained conference interpreters who work for the United Nations are sta as staffers or freelancers and who are then deployed to the field. I think you can, you have already seen how complex the positionality of the interpreter is because they are uh, in the case of locally recruited interpreters. So they have a very complex positionality. I, I'm not going to read this slide, but um, in the first bullet point, I included the definition of the positionality, of positionality. So it is, it is this perspective uh, shaped by our class, race, gender, nationality, political and religious affiliations, sense of place in power hierarchies and status as insider or outsider. We'll have a positionality. What is important as interpreters is to be aware of our positionality. This is called reflexivity in order to 
manage our positionality when we interpret. So we have to consider that interpreters in this context, if they are locally recruited, they uh, are surrounded by all the narratives, uh, uh, these conflict narratives. So it is, well, it is very, well, sometimes this positionality leads them to filter the information, the information received and communicate it through their own experiences. And given that they know about what is happening in the country, they are locals, their role usually goes beyond the mere act of linguistic and cultural mediation, and they adopt a very active presence instead of uh, an invisible one. So these are the factors that influence the interpreter's positionality, the background, the uh, infrastructure of the society in conflict, all these uh, permanent exposure to the conflict narratives I, that, I mean, um, 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 is at the very basis of an ideology and that uh, generates emotions. And also the interpreter's personality and character, of course, that we have to consider as well. We are different, so uh, personality is another factor that influences our positionality. Everything that is related to training, uh, working conditions, and the professional context. So in a conflict zone, be it a military mission, a humanitarian mission, or a human rights mission, the relationship between the interpreters and the other stakeholders is a very complex one because different positionalities, very different sometimes, come into play in the communicative situation. And there is this interaction not only between two primary active parties, but also a third party, the interpreter, that in this setting has very strong assumptions objectives, prejudices, and experiences. So I have I mean, created this figure for you to understand this complex positionality of the interpreter. On the one hand, they share the, um, the, the main language and the culture with the local authorities or the local armed forces, beneficiaries and victims. And on the other hand, since they are recruited by your organization, they uh, belong uh, I mean, they um, they work for that organization and they speak the same language as the delegates, the military personnel, the special rapporteur, etc. So sometimes this positionality uh, um, causes some problems no, of trust. And that is something that we can see in the, con in the military operations in which sometimes uh, the military personnel do not entirely trust the interpreters because of this uh, positionality. And trust, as we all know, is essential uh, um, in any kind of conversation, but particularly in these challenging settings. So let's um, analyze the different profiles, uh, the different types of interpreters. First of all, the military, the, the military linguist, this rare profile of the, um, uh, this uh, soldier no? who works as an interpreter. So we have to understand that the, uh, the military is a total institution. They have their own rules, norms, uh, hierarchy, etc. So they have a very uh, well structured and clearly defined positionality, defined by military codes. Um, so they are I mean, they belong to, to, the, to the institution. So th this means that they know the terminology, they understand uh, this military context, but they, th most of the military linguists, they don't have this, uh, the necessary interpreter training, but they receive the protection that is, I mean, granted by their uh, positionality as members of the military. Then on the other hand, we have the locally recruited civilians, as I said before, they can be locally recruited, but they can be national as well, as in the case of the Iranian interpreters that I mentioned before. They lack this uh, interpreter training and they usually lack uh, protection. We will see that afterwards. And there is a lack of definition of the tasks that they have to perform. So uh, in the end, they perform many, many different tasks that go beyond uh, interpreting. 
the humanitarian interpreter comes from very different backgrounds. Again, we have this lack of interpreter training. Uh, they are usually protected by the humanitarian organization. But again, we see a lack of definition of the tasks uh, to be performed. And in some cases, the problem uh, that's problematic is that they share the beneficiary status, for example, in the case of refugees that we saw before. And then the UN interpreter is a trained interpreter who go on mission to the field. They are trained interpreters, but they have not received a specific training uh, um, as, I mean, as uh, interpreters deployed in, in, in the field. They have a very clear positionality. They are the tasks are very clearly delimited, so they only interpret when they are deployed in uh, this kind of missions. So if we examine the results of all these studies, we can identify some differences uh, between uh, the different profiles of interpreter. So on the one hand, we have the locally recruited interpreters for the military or the uh, humanitarian uh, organizations. And on the other hand, we have United Nations interpreters. And the differences are, I mean, um, in terms of the, the role, the tasks, the status, the training, the recruitment, the context, and also particularly those who work for the military, the, uh, this lack of trust uh, uh, of the interpreter, particularly the local uh, civilians, and also uh, this risk uh, that they face, um, the interpreters working for the military. Uh, this lack of protection, particularly after, after the withdrawal of the, of the troops, and that is something that we have all seen in the media and read in the literature. However, there are a lot of commonalities as well, even if the profiles are very different. Uh, if, well, when I carried out this comparative analysis uh, between the different studies, I, I identified many different commonalities. The first one is that there is an asymmetrical relation of power. Um, between the beneficiary and the delegate, for example, in the humanitarian context, uh, but sometimes as well uh, in the context of, um, uh, in, of a military mission no? between the local armed forces and the, uh, the foreign armed forces. And then the modality used is or consecutive or shushatage, um, improvised consecutive in the case of untrained interpreters without, uh, without notes. Uh, a very intense relationship with the stakeholders. So they go on mission together, uh, they stay uh, in the same places, etc. So they, they, there is this very, very close relationship between uh, the, 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 the delegates, uh, all the military personnel, all the humanitarian agents and the interpreters. Uh, they work together in a team, uh, that's very important, and they work in, very in a very difficult work environment. In the case of the humanitarian on, uh, um, interpretation and human rights missions, the interpreter is usually seen as an ally of the weakest party. So the beneficiary or the victim in the case of human rights missions usually consider the interpreter as their ally because they speak the same language and they share the same culture. So they, the beneficiaries or the victims usually have this tendency to seek the interpreter's assistance. And uh, another important commonality is the, this relevance of empathy uh, as an important uh, emotion and also this compassion. So this concern that interpreters develop for the suffering of others. An important commonality is the lack of training. Uh, with the exception of UN interpreters, we see this lack of training. Why? Because training interpreters in this context is very difficult, usually very unrealistic as well. And what happens is that interpreters create communities of practice. So they try to organize, to get organized, uh, to distribute the tasks. And it is usually the senior interpreters who teach or who train the, the newcomers. And here it is essential, um, it is situated learning. So interpreters learn by doing. So I'm not saying that training is not essential in this context. I'm saying that training them is very difficult because there is sometimes very little time and there is an urgency and interpreters have to be deployed. And the interpreters that are usually needed are those speaking languages for which there are, I mean, there is no 
um, formal uh, interpreter training. So if they have not received any training, we assume that their professional positionality is shaped by interactions with the members of that field rather than by contacts with a wider interpreting community. And sometimes, well, if they are recruited by an organization, by a specific institution, and they don't have this code of ethics of interpreters, and they, uh, their positionality is shaped by these interactions, we could ask ourselves if they can meet this uh, principle of neutrality. In any case, uh, there is a total dependence on the interpreter in these settings. They are essential to uh, facilitate the communication, avoid misunderstandings, cope with dangerous and tense situations. And uh, they are essential because they are the only ones who know the language and even more important, the culture, because they, of course, engage in intercultural communication. So moving on to this, uh, to un to this uh, topic of intercultural communication, um, the interpreter is an intercultural mediator in this context. They, uh, they are the only ones to know what is acceptable in one culture, uh, what is not acceptable in another culture, because we all have different, uh, different cultures. I mean, these settings, the delegate comes from one culture or the military personnel, and then the beneficiary comes from another one. So um, the question that these interpreters are asking uh, all themselves all the time is what uh, they have to make explicit or to explain. And usually, uh, according to my studies, I mean, that's another commonality. They have to explain the cultural norms and behaviors, the religious beliefs, ways to address an interlocutor, and all these elements stemming from an asymmetrical communication between the stakeholders. Try to imagine a situation in which a special rapporteur from the United Nations starts speaking in a very high register, explaining the objectives of the mission to a, um, to a victim, um, and the victim is not understanding the language. So that's uh, another important element that they, sometimes the interpreter, the interpreter has to explain. So they are moving between, I mean, this continuum between interpreting, that is, I mean, verbal communication, well, nonverbal communication as well, but also everything that is related to intercultural communication. And sometimes they have to uh, be explaining many, many things that are uh, related to the culture. However, something that, um, uh, interpreters usually mention, but also the users uh, of interpreters, is that, well, sometimes um, there are communication problems between people who come from the same country, speak the same language, and share the same culture. So the interpreter has to make sure that they do not intervene all the time, uh, because sometimes the communication problems are not uh, due to, uh, uh, to different cultures. So I would like to highlight that um, culture is a very complex concept. It goes beyond uh, its consideration of belonging to one group of, or another. Uh, it is a dynamic process that adapts to specific environmental and technical conditions. And of course, and I highlighted that social and political circumstances, and, but also on the background, lived experiences and the level of adaptation uh, to the dominant culture and, of course, to emotions and ideology. And I would like to say a few words about that. In a conflict zone, uh, I'm going to, to explain what I have in, um, inserted in this slide. In a conflict zone, interpreters or people are immersed uh, in the narrative of the conflict. And they are surrounded by messages that influence the way they appraise a conflict. Uh, and of course, this situation gives rise to intense emotions. So if interpreters are locally recruited, they and they have been surrounded by this message, it's only normal that they have a certain ideology and uh, that they have developed uh, certain emotions. So sometimes these emotions have an impact on uh, the way they behave and the decisions that they make. For example, in my study with uh, Afghan interpreters, the most important uh, emotion is the, uh, the emotion of fear. So they 
they weren't sure about who was going to listen to them. So they filtered the information to uh, just in case um, uh, I mean, they they were uh, they had they were listened no by 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 well um, well they didn't know who was there to listen to them so and another important element is that as interpreters we are not mere observers we are involved in the process of facilitating the communication which in these cases in these settings uh, is extremely complex so that triggers psychological uh, psychological that has in psychological implications as well try to imagine for example in a in a, an interview between the special rapporteur and the victim this can be very hard to listen to. And you have to put all this information in the first person and convey it. So this has um, very serious uh, psychological implications. So what is important here, and this is a challenge highlighted by uh, the interpreters in my different studies, is to identify, to be able to identify all these negative uh, and positive emotions as well, and be able to control them and um, avoid uh, the, um, um, and prevent. Uh, so be aware of that to, um, make decisions that uh, have not been impacted by the emotions. Because we are always making decisions as interpreters uh, and uh, our decisions have ethical implications. So in interpretation, we are used to having codes of ethics, um, but interpreting in areas of conflict requires a teleological approach rather than a deontological approach to ethics. And why is that so? Because interpreters in a conflict zone uh, with the military, humanitarian, etc., they are confronted with non-routine situations. So uh, sometimes, I mean, they cannot go to the code of, ethic, of ethics to see no, uh, how they should behave. So they have to analyze the situation and then uh, make a decision um, based on the end result, on the consequences of that action. And that's how, even if they didn't know that they were doing that, no, that's how they reacted in this kind of situation. So analyzing the, the situation, then I have to make a decision, what will be the consequences of my decision? And um, they followed this kind of teleological approach uh, to ethics. Since most of the interpreters in this context are untrained, they usually base their decisions on common sense, on intuition, which is quite, quite helpful. Huh? Some, uh, but of course, it should be accompanied by, um, by the, this uh, knowledge of the codes of ethics, etc. So um, what is usually uh, important when um, any training program is um, organized in these settings is to provide the interpreters with these tools, with these uh, ethical codes, for them to apply them in routine situations. But it is very important for them to be able to conceptualize the codes and the principles through ethical reasoning when the situations are complex. And sometimes it is important to mention here that interpreters in this context work uh, for an organization that has a code, so a code of ethics and uh, they are interpreters, so they have to observe to ethical codes at the same time. So um, something that is very difficult for interpreters in this context is to um, stay uh, within the boundaries. Uh, I mean, they, the only reason they are there is because the interlocutors do not share the same language. But this is something very difficult to understand by interpreters who work in a conflict zone, because they usually want to go beyond uh, interpreting, beyond intercultural communication, to adopt, as I said at the beginning, this active presence. Um, and another thing that is uh, um, something that is not that easy for them to understand is that the interlocutors are responsible for what they say. So everything that is striking a balance uh, in their role as interpreters is uh, quite challenging. And of course, uh, understanding that interpreters have no control over the outcome of the encounter. What we 
can do is to influence uh, the communication by making ethically informed decisions. So I would like to uh, uh, mention a few conclusions after having um, identified all these uh, commonalities, uh, after all these um, um, based no, on all these studies, uh, is that the main conclusion for me is that interpreting um, in a conflict zone is extremely challenging. Well, I, I'm sure we all agree on that. Um, there is a very complex matrix of implications. So practical, of course, uh, everything that is related to the technique, uh, the interpreting technique, uh, etc. But there is a very important uh, ethical part. So the ethical implications uh, of interpreting in a conflict zone. I think that um, the psychological implications are um, uh, extremely important here. Um, and there have been some works carried out in the context of community interpreting, not that many in the context of interpreting in conflict zones. And there is this emotional load um, uh, when you interpret in this context. You know? So you experience positive emotions, such as empathy, compassion, etc., but negative ones as well, as I mentioned before, fear, uh, hatred, uh, anger, uh, when you cannot control the situation. And um, all these emotions have an impact on, on, on may have could have an impact on our decisions as interpreters so that's uh, that's why it is very important to be able to recognize them and control them and of course there are all, everything that is related to security and protection because it is dangerous so working in this context is is dangerous and entails many many risks so what can we say about the interpreters working for the military uh, and about humanitarian interpreters? Well, they share these points. Uh, they are people who end up interpreting rather than interpreters who end up working in a particular field, and that's important. Um, because their role as an interpreter is contingent on their positioning in the field in question, they are usually interpreters because they were hired by someone as such. So before that, I mean, they weren't interpreters. Um, and then uh, when the assignment is over, many stop working as an interpreter. So as you, uh, as you can see, um, um, this, bring, I mean, this uh, entails uh, many, many challenges. And I think the most important challenge here is this difficulty to train them. Who should be training them? Where exactly? Um, uh, and then what to include in these training programs? Well, here in Geneva, we have a training program with the ICRC. And of course, you have to touch upon uh, topics such as, uh, well, not only the skills, interpreting skills, but ethic, ethic, uh, ethical issues, how to protect themselves, uh, et cetera. So, but it is extremely difficult because there is no time. And then in the case of UN interpreters, because this is another category, as I said, well, they are fully fledged interpreters. For them, contrary to the other interpreters, missions are a kind of bracket or parenthesis from their daily work in the booth. So they usually work in the booth and from time to time they go to the field. Um, they are trained interpreters, but they have not received uh, uh, any training for facing the challenges uh, in the field. And uh, they have a clear allegiance. They are staff interpreters uh, who have been recruited as freelancers by the United Nations. And they know about the code of ethics. They have clearly defined working conditions, uh, though they all recognize that uh, flexibility is essential in the field. So my final conclusion would be that uh, interpreting, um, I mean, um, is uh, a very complex profession. I mean, uh, interpreting conflict zones is extremely complex. The positionality of these interpreters is extremely complex as well. We have seen that they belong to the community that is in conflict uh, most of the time. Uh, but I would say, and that's a, a positive final conclusion, that we are essential. Interpreters are essential in all conflicts, even if it's sometimes they are invisible. Um, they are essential in all situations. And that is one of the 
of the findings and of the commonality uh, between the different studies. And also the one I, I'm, I'm conducting now with fixers working for uh, journalists in Ukraine. Um, without the interpreters, they cannot do anything. Hmm? So, and I have included here, well, it is in Spanish, uh, but uh, it, it highlights the, the what I am saying, no? this essential role that the interpreters play. Um, that, I mean, but very basically what uh, Bustamante, that is the author, is telling us here is that when uh, the Afghan general called him uh, by phone, uh, he really needed an interpreter because uh, if he doesn't find the interpreter, the situation uh, can be uh, a disaster, more or less. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you have now I, um, this overview uh, of uh, what um, uh, interpreting in, the, in a conflict zone means. Uh, that, um, Interpreting in a conflict zone is not only interpreting for the military, but there are other agents involved as well, such as humanitarian organizations, etc. And sometimes in conflict related situations, we have these uh, human rights missions, even if they have a different status. So that was my idea to give you an overview of different contexts, different categories of interpreters and different challenges. Thank you very much.